Hey, welcome back to the channel, everyone. And this week's video is a replay of a VPN deep dive we did some time back. And we've had a lot of our students ask that we put it on YouTube. So that's what we're doing right now. Hi, my name is Kevin Wallace. And in this VPN deep dive, we're gonna begin by taking a look at what is a VPN? What are its benefits? Then we're gonna contrast a site to site and a remote access VPN. We'll talk about our first VPN protocol, GRE, and then we'll demonstrate how to set up a GRE tunnel. But one of the challenges with a GRE is that it is not secure. However, IPsec is. We'll check out the theory of IPsec and then see how to use these two the VPN protocols in tandem and do GRE over IPsec. Then we'll take it a step further and check out DM VPNs, dynamic multipoint VPNs. And after discussing the theory, we'll see how to set up a DM VPN. Then finally, we're going to contrast a dynamic multipoint VPN with SD-WAN technologies, software defined wide area networks. And if you enjoy this training and want to go deeper with us, I invite you to check out our Udemy site. Just go to kwtrain.com slash Udemy, where you can select from any of these certification training courses that we've created for the low, low Udemy pricing. Now, get ready to take some notes as we take a deep dive into VPNs. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our VPN deep dive. I'm really excited about this presentation because this is one of those times where we are really diving deep. We're going to be peeling back the layers of VPN. We're going to do a bunch of demos for you. I think you'll really enjoy today's session and feel like it was really worth your time showing up. Specifically, here's what we got on tap for today. We're going to begin at a high level. If you're not super familiar with VPNs, we're going to begin by talking about why do we need a VPN? What does it do for us? It's, it's not just one thing. It can help us out in multiple ways. We'll talk about some of those. Then we'll contrast a couple of categories of VPNs. We'll talk about site to site versus remote access VPNs. And then we're going to start peeling back the layers, as I say. We're going to begin with a GRE tunnel. And we'll talk about why that's such a great thing and how that can help us. And it can do network path virtualization, which is uh, something you'll hear a lot about. Then we're going to say, but there's an issue. And we're going to solve that issue after we demo GRE. We're going to solve that issue with IPsec. And we'll demo IPsec. And then we'll say, well, that doesn't really scale very well. And we'll address that issue by going another layer deeper. We're peeling back the, the layers of the onion, if you will, to, uh, to really get deep here into VPNs. And then we're going to start talking about DM VPNs, dynamic multipoint VPNs. And we're even going to demonstrate that for you. So lots of super cool demos coming out today. And then we're going to say, how can we be even more flexible and more scalable than a DM VPN? And the answer is SD-WANs. And we'll talk about uh, software-defined wide area networks just a bit. So I think it's going to be a great couple of hours. That's my guess. It'll be two hours, give or take give or take two hours. I don't know. I think it'll be about two hours. We'll see. But for those of you that, uh, that, that saw this and said, who is this Kevin Wallace guy? Here's my super quick bio since we're going to be spending a couple of hours together. My name is Kevin Wallace and I've been working with this stuff for a long time. I've got a couple of CCIEs, uh, one in route switch. Uh, now it's enterprise infrastructure and uh, one in collaboration and uh, really goes back to 1989. I started working with the very first model of Cisco router. It was the old uh, Cisco AGS Plus router, if anybody out there remembers that. And I just fell in love with it and started doing more and more with Cisco. And I taught courses for Cisco Learning Partners for about 14 years, but probably my favorite real world job was Walt Disney World. I'm a huge Disney fan. I don't know if you can see in the background, I've, I've got some, there's probably a Mickey and some Star Wars things up there on my uh, on my bookshelf. But uh, yeah, I got to be one of five network designers down at Walt Disney World in Florida. And I, um, I designed the network that tied together the Magic Kingdom and Epcot and uh, the studios and Animal Kingdom and some of the resorts. It was just an amazing place to work. And they were an all Cisco shop with over 500 Cisco routers, thousands of Cisco catalyst switches. It was, uh, it, was, uh, it was a dream job for sure. 
And I've written a bunch of books, done a bunch of videos for the folks over at Cisco Press. I was a distinguished speaker a couple of times at Cisco Live. That's fun. I always like to go to Cisco Live when I can and and, uh, and meet my students because I'm normally looking at a camera and uh, even though uh, they can see me, I cannot see you. So it's uh, it's great when I can meet people in person. But the bottom line of all this is I love this stuff and I am super excited to share with you a, a more advanced topic today. Some of our deep dives um, are, well, they're at all levels. I think our last one might have been on IP subnetting. That's more of an entry level topic. Here we're getting a little bit deeper and I think you'll enjoy that today. All right, let's jump into our first topic, which is the benefits of a virtual private network. Why do we need these things and exactly what is it? Well, for one thing, I remember back in the day when I used to work on networks that interconnected different sites. I remember working with Frame Relay. I remember working with, uh, I worked with ATM. I worked with uh, lease lines like T1s. I even worked with 56K lease lines. That was a long time ago. But that would give us a nice, secure, dedicated connection. Well, not really dedicated with Frame Relay, but a pretty secure connection between different sites. But now we have the internet. We've got high speed internet at our locations. Why not just use that? And the challenge is security. What if there is a bad actor out on the internet that is going to capture those packets and sniff those packets and, and look at our data? We don't want that. The internet is an untrusted network. How do we protect ourselves as our traffic is flowing back and forth across the internet? Well, that's one of the things that a VPN can do for us. It can give us a secured path. We can encrypt our data. We're going to be setting that up today, and we've got lots of options. I can't wait to talk to you about all the, all the, all the cool encryption stuff coming up. But we're going to be able to have this secure tunnel between these two sites. So it looks like just a, a, a dedicated lease line. We just happen to be going through the internet, and if anybody were to encrypt or intercept our data, they wouldn't be able to do anything with it because it's all scrambled up. Another benefit of uh, using a virtual private network is something called network path virtualization. You might have heard of virtualization when we, uh, when we think about virtualizing servers. Maybe you have VMware ESXi and you virtualize a Linux box or maybe uh, Microsoft Windows 11, you virtualize that and you can have virtual servers. Well, that's not all we can virtualize. Uh, we, uh, I, I was um, just recently uh, working on updating our Encore course, and it talks about virtualizing uh, routers. You can have a router inside of a router, and it's called VRF, uh, Virtual Routing and Forwarding. But what we're talking about here, something else we talk about in Encore, is virtualizing paths. You see, we might have a very complicated network underneath that interconnect to different locations within our company. We might have maybe even different vendors of routers, different vendors of, uh, of switches. And I'm thinking, well, I'm at this site. I want to have an, an OSPF neighborship with somebody at this other site, but how's that gonna happen? Because I have to pass through all these other routers in between. Well, what we can do is virtualize a network path. The actual physical underlying network that's called the underlay network, but we can extract from that and superimpose upon that some virtual paths. Even though these layer three switches we have on screen, they may not be physically adjacent, but they're logically adjacent. We can make it look like one switch or one multi-layer switch or one router is one hop away from another router. They can form a neighborship. They can exchange hello messages even though they're physically transiting multiple, multiple routers. So it allows us to take a very unpredictable and dynamic and complicated uh, underlying network and we can say, well, I wish, it, I wish I didn't have to go through five routers. Well, logically you don't. You can virtualize your network paths. Those are a couple of advantages. And there's a couple of categories I want you to know about when it comes to VPNs, site to site, which is mainly what we've been talking about so far, and also remote access VPNs. 
with a site-to-site -site VPN, this is where you might be interconnecting a couple of your corporate locations, maybe HQ and a remote sales office perhaps. Well, they both have high-speed connectivity to the internet, so why not just use that connectivity? Because when I was installing and working with things like the T1s and frame relay networks, that was expensive. But now I've got I've got a gig up and down in my home right now, fiber, uh, AT and T fiber for a hundred bucks a month. That's incredible, a gig up and down for a hundred bucks a month. Yeah, let's use that low cost bandwidth that's out there today, and we can protect the data going between our sites over the internet using VPN technologies. So we don't have to buy some dedicated circuit. We can use common technologies that are out there and the end devices have no clue. In, in this scenario, now yes, we'll talk about VPN software that I can install on a laptop. Uh, there's a time for that, but, but it's not this. This is where you've got your computers within each of the sites. They have no clue that there's a VPN between them. They just go to their default gateway, R1 or R2, and it gets them to their destination. It doesn't have to know about the VPN, so there's no work to do on the clients. And I'm showing routers here as being at the endpoints of the VPN. That is an option. If you've got, let's say, a headquarters perhaps, you can actually buy dedicated VPN concentrators where you can have lots and lots of incoming uh, VPN connections to go out to multiple, multiple remote sites. But this is when we're interconnecting a couple of offices. But there's also the concept of a remote access VPN. Maybe you've got, especially now, uh, in today's world, we have lots and lots of remote workers working from home, but they need to do it securely. I know uh, my daughter, uh, She, uh, her company lets her work a certain number of days from home, and uh, she has to come in the office like one or two days. But when she's working from home, uh, she's able to get on her laptop and securely connect in to their corporate network because she is running uh, VPN client software. Uh, I noticed on her laptop, uh, she showed me she was running uh, one of the, the Cisco software offerings that I'll mention here in just a second. But if we don't have a router that's doing the lifting of, of uh, the VPN encryption and decryption and authentication and all that fun stuff, we can have our client do it. Why not? That way we can, if you've got a mobile sales force, then they go from hotel room to hotel room, the road warriors as I call them they can just fire up their VPN and from the convenience of their hotel room, securely connect back in to the corporate office. There's an option where we don't have to have a, a, any software on the client. We could use something called clientless VPN. Uh, Cisco has something called uh, clientless Cisco SSL VPN. We're using web security technologies to go into a web portal to get us to certain resources back at the headquarters. But the most flexibility comes when it looks like we're actually at the corporate headquarters, that our machine is on the same subnet. And we can do that using the Cisco AnyConnect, uh, AnyConnect VPN. Uh, let's, I, I think I got a top on screen there. The uh, SSL should not be in that bottom bullet I just noticed. Yes, yeah, the Cisco AnyConnect uh, VPN software. I use that frequently if I'm trying to connect to the Cisco DevNet sandbox to do some stuff on their equipment. And uh, yeah, it's pretty awesome. And uh, it's, it's, uh, I, think it's, I think it's free. I go to the Cisco DevNet sandbox and they say, click here to download the VPN software and, uh, and it works great. Now that we understand the advantages of a VPN, the, uh, the, the virtual network paths that we can have, the security across an untrusted network. We know that we can interconnect sites or we can interconnect a client and a site. Let's start talking about some of the, the protocols and some of the configuration that makes all this work. Beginning, and again, I said this is a deep dive. We're gonna be peeling back the layers of VPN and saying, here's this great technology. And then we're gonna go deeper and then we're gonna go deeper, and then we're gonna go deeper. But let's start here with a GRE tunnel. This is a way that we could do a virtual network path. Maybe I've got 
Maybe I've got multiple routers between R1 and R2. Maybe they're in different countries or on different sides of the country, for example. We could look like they're adjacent to one another. I could do show CDP neighbors, and I see that router on the other side of the country, even though it's going through 15 routers inside the internet, because I virtually created a path with this tunnel. Uh, metaphorically, I think of a garden hose. Uh, this garden hose, we might have to run it through a, uh, over a gate, around the corner, behind a bush, but I can plug one end to the faucet and I can plug the other end to my the little nozzle I want to use to, to water my, my trees, for example. It doesn't know about all the stuff the, the, the garden hose has to go through. I just know water on one side, nozzle on the other. That's what we're doing with this Jiri tunnel. We can create this virtual path. This is giving us that overlay network. There's a big downside though. I know I position VPNs as being this great solution to security concerns, and they can be, but not just with GRE. GRE does not do security uh, at all. It, uh, it doesn't do any encryption or authentic. It doesn't do security. We'll have to revisit and see how do we might overcome that in a moment. But one thing that is great about GRE, it is super flexible. It can encapsulate just about any kind of data you can possibly imagine. About any kind of packet that you would send out of a Cisco interface, GRE can handle that. What I mean is it can handle, of course, unicast traffic. It can handle broadcast traffic. It can handle multicast traffic. If you even had non-IP protocols, I remember back in the day, I used to, I don't think anybody would be doing that these days uh, in this group, but um, I used to encaps or I used to run Novell's IPX and I used to run uh, Apple's uh, Apple Talk, if anybody remembers that. It can encapsulate pretty much anything, which is great. It's flexible, but it's not secure. But don't worry, we'll, uh, we'll address that. But first, as we start to go deeper and deeper in this deep dive, I want to show you a demonstration of how we can set up a GRE tunnel. So let me take you out to a live interface. And I'm going to get my face off the screen and bring up a topology that you can see. I think that will let you see everything just a little bit better. And here's what we're trying to do. Notice that I've got R1 on the left, I've got R4 on the right. I want to create a tunnel between those so they look like they're adjacent to one another. Now that tunnel is going to be a network link, so it needs IP addressing. And I've chosen to give each end of that link a private IP addressing, 192.168.0.1 slash 30 on one side, 192.168.0 slash 2 slash 30 on the other side. I used a slash 30 because there's only two IP addresses that I need. But notice we're going through a couple of other routers, R2 and R3. But that's going to be transparent from the perspective of R1 and R4. It looks like they're going to be directly connected. Let's take a look at how to set this up with a Jiri tunnel. It's fairly simple. I'm going to go into global configuration mode. And out of thin air, I'm going to create a, a virtual interface. It's called a tunnel interface. I'll say tunnel. And I could give, uh, I should well, it's interface tunnel, excuse me. Interface tunnel. And I can give a number. Pretty much any number I want to. I'll just say tunnel 1. And I need to assign an IP address to the R1 side of the tunnel. And you can see that its IP address is 192.168.0.1. We've got a 30-bit subnet mask. So that's going to be 255.255.255.252. We'll press enter. Now I need to say, what is, from my perspective, I'm on R1. From my perspective, what's the source? What's the destination? Well, I'm going to be going out of my gig 0 slash 0 interface. That's my source. So I'll say my tunnel source is gig 0 slash 0. Now, I need to say what the destination is. Well, my destination is that ingress interface over on R4. I'll point to its IP address. 
you can see that it's part of the 198.51.100.0/30 network. Specifically, uh, I'm going to say the tunnel destination is at an IP address of 198.51.100. It looks like .2 is on the gig 0 slash 1 interface going into R4. That's my destination. And I'm done on R1. Let's go to, uh, I'll exit this. And let's go over to router R4. I don't have to do anything on R2 and R3. That's like routers on the internet. We're transparently going through those. But on R4, we'll do a mirror configuration. I'll go into global configuration mode and I'll say interface tunnel one. Those don't have to match, by the way. I'm just making it easy for me to remember. And I'll say I have an IP address of this end of the tunnel of 192.168.0.2, 30 bit subnet mass 255.255.255.252. Now, from the perspective of R4 this time, What's the source? What's the destination? Well, from my perspective on R4, my tunnel source is my interface gig 0 slash 1. And the destination is that ingress interface going into R1. The tunnel destination, in other words, is 192.160. Oh, nope. It's 192.0.2.1. That's the public IP address going into R1, 192.0.2.1, just making sure I had that entered correctly. And uh, I think we're done. So we'll say end. We should now have a tunnel. Let's see if we do. I'll say show IP interface brief. And you'll notice that I have an interface of tunnel one. Here is its IP address on R4. And you'll see that it is in the up, up state. Awesome. D can I ping the other side of this tunnel, I wonder? Can I ping 192.168.0.1? And I can. Look at that. Perfect. Now, if I do a trace route to that, is it going to go through R3, R2, R1? Well, it's going to look like it's just one hop away because I've got this virtual path that we've created. I'm going to say trace route over to 192.168.0.1. I'll press enter. And look at that. It is just one hop away. In fact, I'm running OSPF on this topology and I have formed an OSPF neighborship with R3, obviously, because it's adjacent, but now it looks like R1 is adjacent. Do you think I've formed a neighborship there? Let's see. Let's do a show IP OSPF neighbor command. And I've got two neighbors. Notice that I've got, uh, I've got a neighbor of 192.0.2.1. Huh. That's over the tunnel interface. I am adjacent to R1 because it looks like it's right next to me. It looks like it's one hop away. Oh, before I go on, let me just make a sort of a side note here. A lot of people have a false sense of security when they set up a GRE tunnel. They think, awesome, I've got this great tunnel. I'm always going to be using it. By default, Cisco doesn't assign a lot of bandwidth to this virtual tunnel. Check this out. I'll say show interface tunnel 1. How much bandwidth does it have? It thinks it has a bandwidth of 100 kilobits per second. That's kind of slow by today's standards, I would say. Not 100 meg, 100 K. So I like to generally bump that up a little bit. I'll normally, let's go into interface uh, tunnel one, and I'll say bandwidth, and I'll make it well, that's still not too much, but it's better than it was. I said, make it 10,000K, which is uh, 10 meg. And uh, let me give a mirror configuration. Actually, uh, yeah, I, I, I won't go through the process of 
I won't go through the process of, of doing it all across the board just for time's sake, but I think you understand why we might want to go in and, uh, and say that our bandwidth is really higher than 100K. Otherwise, we might have some suboptimal routing going on. Just a, just a little side note for you. All right, let's get back. Let's get back to our discussion and see if we can overcome that issue that we talked about where GRE is great in that it is flexible, but it's not secure. What is secure? IPsec. See, we're going another level deep now. IPsec, which is just short for IP security, that is going to give us tremendous levels of security. Specifically, an IPsec tunnel, it can encrypt our traffic. In other words, it can scramble it up, but it can give us integrity. Now, here's what I mean by integrity. I want to make sure that my data is not modified in transit. If I'm sending a bank deposit uh, to, uh, to a certain account number, I want to make sure somebody doesn't change that account number and send it to their, to their bank instead. So I want to make sure data is not modified in transit. And the way we do that is using hashing algorithms. A hash is not an encryption. That, a lot of people get that one mixed up. Uh, think of a hash as a fingerprint. Imagine you take a three-letter word like cat and you run a hashing algorithm on it, like, uh, like the MD5 hashing algorithm. It's going to generate, it's going to do some math on the word cat, and it's going to generate a 128-bit result. That result is called a hash digest. So if I know the password is cat, I'll run that algorithm and have this hash digest, and I'll send it to you. You know the password's cat, so you're going to run the hashing algorithm on the word cat, and you're going to create your own hash digest. And you're going to compare the two together and see if they're equal. If they're equal, then you've got, a, you've got some pretty good assurance that the data has not been modified in transit because we were able to create the same value, the same hash result. It will also do authentication and make sure we're talking to a trusted party on the other end of this IPsec tunnel. We can do that with pre-shared keys. We can do that with uh, digital certificates. And another really cool feature, the anti-replay feature, that's going to prevent somebody from capturing traffic. And uh, for example, let's say that somebody was monitoring the network. They were sniffing my network and I log in from my uh, client or I, this router logs in to R2 to set up the tunnel and they capture those packets and they, may, uh, and they think, well, I don't know what the password is because it was encrypted, but whatever it was, I just captured it. So I have a valid password that's encrypted. I'll just come back later tonight and I'll play that sequence of packets and that'll get me into R2 because I've got a valid password with a valid encryption. I don't know what it is, but it's encrypted. I'll just send it to R2. R2 will, R2 will decrypt it. That's not going to work because of the anti-replay feature of IPsec. It's almost like they, they assign sequence numbers to the packets to make sure they're arriving in order. So if I capture sequence or if I capture traffic that logs into R2 at 10 a.m., if I come back at 11 a.m. and try to play those back, it's not going to work. The sequence numbers are going to be all messed up. So IPsec, very secure, but it has a downside. Remember how I was, uh, I was singing the praises of GRE being super flexible in that it could encapsulate just about anything you could imagine? IPsec... Not so much. IPsec can only encapsulate unicast IP packets. Is that a problem? Is most of our traffic unicast? Well, maybe, but I think we really do need multicasts a lot. OSPF hello messages, a lot of routing protocols, multicast traffic. We need multicast support anyway. Yeah maybe broadcast sometimes too, but we certainly need more than unicast IP packets. That's a problem. And we'll try to address that in a few moments as well. But first, some more information about IPsec. When we get into the configuration of IPsec in a moment, you're going to see that we, we need to specify a mode of operation. And we've got two options. 
We've got transport mode. Now, transport mode is going to use the original packets header, meaning if I'm going from my IP address to your IP address and somebody captures that packet, even though the payload might be all scrambled up, they know it's coming from me to you because our IP addresses are visible. Maybe that's okay. If so, that's transport mode. If you want to hide that, if you don't want the, the actual source and destination IP addresses being visible, then you can do tunnel mode. That is going to encapsulate the entire packet and it's going to put on, it's going to put on new headers. So the, the source and destination IP addresses now on that packet are going to be the source and destination IP addresses of, in this case, R1 and R2, not the clients. Uh, well, actually, it's going to be the, uh, it's going to be the IP address. Yeah, that, that's true. Yeah, it's going to be the IP addresses of R1 and R2, not the actual clients that are setting up the communication. The de you might say, well, let's always do that. That sounds more secure. Well, there's a trade-off. We now have a bigger packet because we just had to slap on another header. Uh, so it's going to be more bandwidth intensive, but it's going to hide some more stuff. So case by case, you got to decide what to use there. Also, IPsec, even though it can do encryption, doesn't have to. It could just be used for authentication. There's an, there's an authentication header option that's going to authenticate the entire IP packet. That includes the outer IP header. It does not do encryption, however. There is an encryption option. It's called ESP. That's what we'll be using in our demo. That stands for Encapsulating Security Payload. And it is able to authenticate the IP packet, but not the IP header. But I think this more than makes up for it, in my opinion, it does encryption. Yeah, I probably want to encrypt my traffic. So we're going to have those options. Now, let me help you visualize how this gets set up because it's a two-part process. For your notes, I'd like you to write down that when we set up an IPsec tunnel, we're going to go through two phases. There is Ike phase one, where we set up a tunnel called an ISACAMP tunnel. And you see on screen what ISACAMP stands for. It stands for Internet Security Association of Key Management Protocol. That's the ISACAMP tunnel. You could use that term interchangeably with Ike, uh, with Ike phase one. Ike, uh, that's Internet Key Exchange. That's the initial tunnel that gets set up. Why do we need two tunnels? Well, within the protection of this first tunnel, we're going to set up a second tunnel, the actual IPsec tunnel. That's an IP, uh, that's an Ike Phase 2 tunnel. Here's the metaphor I'd like you to think about. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the... I used to watch the old TV show, uh, Get Smart. If you've not seen that one, maybe you've seen or you might want to go watch the, um, the Steve Carell movie, uh, Get Smart. It is one of the funniest movies I've seen in uh, years. I think it came out maybe six, seven years ago, but Steve Carell, hilarious in that great movie. But um, in the movie Get Smart, if you've seen that or if you've seen the TV show, you know that Max is always wanting to have secure communication with, um, with the chief and uh, the chief of control, uh, it's control versus chaos. And uh, he will insist on the cone of silence. Now, the way that typically works in the old TV show is there would be this big cone that would come over both of their heads and it was supposed to allow them to communicate privately, but nobody outside could hear. I think in the movie, it's some sort of electric field or something. But uh, the idea was the cone of silence allowed two parties to communicate securely while not allowing anyone else to hear what was going on. It, it never really worked out right in the, in, for comedic effect in the movie or the show, but that was that idea. That's what Ike Phase 1 does. Ike Phase 1 is your cone of silence, your isokemp tunnel. It's your cone of silence. Once that secure tunnel gets set up, we're then going to negotiate the security parameters for Ike Phase 2, your IPsec tunnel. For example, if, if you're using a pre-shared key, well, that pre-shared key is going to be shared between those two, those two end devices, R1 and R2 in our case. It's going to be shared between them under the protection of this ISACAMP tunnel. 
and we'll see how to set that up. So we've got several decisions to make when we set up an IPsec tunnel. Transport mode or tunnel mode? Authentication header or encapsulating security payload? Are we going to be using a pre-shared key or a digital certificate? And you'll see all that as we get into the demo. But let's see if we can now overcome the issue that GRE had, and which was it could encapsulate anything, but it was not secure. And the issue that IPsec had, which was it was really secure, but it could only encapsulate unicast IP packets. What if we did this? What if we use them as a team? We use them together. What if first we took our data and we encapsulated inside of GRE? So I've got all these GRE packets containing all my data. What is a GRE packet? Yeah, it's a unicast IP packet. D do you see where I'm going with this? I can encapsulate anything, multicast, broadcast, uh, unicast, Apple Talk, IP uh, or IPX, anything we can encapsulate inside of these GRE packets, which are unicast IP packets, which we can then take and encapsulate those inside of IPsec. So we're going to be doing GRE over IPsec. We take anything. Broadcast, multicast, unicast, anything. Wrap it up in Jiri. Suddenly, it's an IP, uh, suddenly it's a unicast IP packet. We wrap that up inside of IPsec, and now we're securing any kind of traffic. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna use those in tandem, and that's gonna solve both of our issues. And this is a very common way of setting up a VPN. And I want to demonstrate it for you. We're going to protect those GRE packets, which encapsulate anything, in the protection of an IPsec tunnel. So let's go back to that topology that we, we were using earlier. We've got a GRE tunnel set up. Let's, let's protect that now. Let's protect that with IPsec. So the Jiri tunnel is already there. That's step one. Now, let's go back over to router R1. And on router R1, here's how we set up an IPsec tunnel. First of all, I'm going to go into global configuration mode and think back to what I was telling you about uh, the Get Smart movie. Remember, we had Ike Phase 1, the Cone of Silence. And it's within the cone of silence that we'll be negotiating the parameters for Ike Phase 2, also known as the actual IPsec tunnel. Well, step one is we need to set up the ISACAMP tunnel, Ike Phase 1. We need to now configure the cone of silence. Here's how we do that. We say crypto. We're going to say crypto. And lots of things we could give here if we look at context-sensitive help, but we're wanting to configure this Ike Phase 1, which we called ISACAMP. We're going to configure this ISACAMP tunnel. So I'll say ISACAMP. And then I can say policy. And what I'm giving here is the priority of the configuration I'm about to give. You see, I could have more than one set of... Uh, Encapsul or encryption and authentication protocols that I'm using, and I might need to negotiate with the far end. Well, I support uh, I support uh, AES, but I don't support triple DES, and I support uh, MD5, but I don't support SHA-1. We can have different permutations and combinations of of, of security matter that uh, we would have to negotiate with another party, and we could say with this priority number uh, of ten, which one I prefer. In my case, I don't really care because I, I know what's on the other end and I'm going to make a match. So this, the priority number really doesn't have a meaning for me. But now I'm going to say, what kind of encryption do I want to use? Here are my options. Triple DES, AES, and DES. The preferred method is AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard. And now I'm going to say, how am I going to be doing my authentication? Am I going to be using some sort of digital certificate? Uh, we, we won't get into setting that up today. Let's just use a pre-shared key. How about that? I'll say that the authentication is going to be pre-share. It's going to be a pre-shared key. 
And then I say, all right, I've specified for this cone of silence, this Ike phase one tunnel, I've specified, here's the encryption I'm using, AES. Here's the uh, kind of authentication I'm using, pre-share. Okay, once I get this secure tunnel set up, what algorithm am I going to be using to protect the exchange of the keys that we're going to be using for, or, or, when we negotiate this Ike phase two tunnel, the, uh, the IPsec tunnel? How am I going to protect that information? And we're going to use an algorithm called uh, Diffie-Hellman, which uh, gets really mathematical. It gets, uh, well, we won't get into that, but it gets really mathematical. Trust me on that when it gets into mod uh, moduluses or mod how do, what's the plural of modulus? Moduli? I don't know. It gets into modular math. We're, we're not going to talk about that today. But uh, boss, basically, you say group, and this is a Diffie-Hellman group. And you specify one of these numbers. <laughs> Basically, the bigger the better. The bigger the more the more secure it is. Just so I can easily remember this, I'm going to say it's a two, uh, which is not recommended, by the way. But this is a lab environment. And I just want to be able to remember it. I'll say it's a two, and um, we're almost done. I did say. We're setting up this ISOGIMP tunnel. I said that we're going to use a pre-share key. I said that we're going to use this kind of encryption. I said how we're going to protect the key exchange. But I need to say what my pre-shared key is. My pre-shared key, I say, crypto ISOGIMP, Ike phase one. My key that I'm sharing, let's make it something easy to remember, not something to use in the real world. I'll say it's it's Kevin's key. Let's make sure I get the spelling right. That's going to be Kevin's key. And now I can say, what range of IP addresses will I allow to talk to me? Will I form a tunnel with? Well, just to keep it simple in this environment, I'm going to say anybody. I know who I'm pointing to. I'll just say, I'll just give 0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0. I'll say, I'll talk to anybody. And there's only going to be one other party that we're talking to. So now we're done with Ike phase one. Hopefully not too complicated. Uh, we said uh, we wanted to create this ISOCAMP policy. We're going to use AES. We're going to use a pre-shared key. We're going to protect the key exchange with Diffie-Hellman Group 2. We said what that pre-shared key was and said we'd talk to anybody. Now that we've got the, um, the cone of silence set up, let's configure Ike Phase 2. To do that, I'll say crypto. But this time, instead of saying ISOCAMP, I'm going to say IPSEC which is the same as Ike phase two. And I'm going to create, I'm not just going to individually say, here's the encryption type I'm going to be using. No, I'm going to define something called a transform set. I'll say transform set, and I'll just name it KW train. And here, the first thing I want to do is to specify what kind of, uh, what kind of encryption I want to use. Now notice that some of these begin with AH. Remember that was authentication header. and it, uh, That's not doing encryption. Some of these begin with ESP, encapsulating security payload. Those do encryption. So I'm going to use one of those. I'm going to say ESP-AES. So I'm using encapsulating security payload. I'm going to be, or I'm going to be encrypting my payload. And I'm going to use the advanced encryption standard to do that. We're not done yet, though. Now I say, how do I want to make sure that traffic is not modified in transit? Remember the hashing we talked about earlier? Well, one of the options I want to use is, uh, this will be easy to remember, uh, SHA, Secure Hash Algorithm, which is, and there's different levels of SHA. I'll just pick, pick the basic one. Uh, SHA typically is better than MD5. So I'll say, I'll say that I'm going to use... Oh, oh, I highlighted the authentication header. I still want to choose the uh, the ESP version of that. So I'll say ESP SHA HMAC. So let's say ESP hyphen secure hash algorithm hyphen HMAC. Now, what does HMAC mean? Well, HMAC, that stands for hash-based message authentication code. You see, here's the deal. Remember I said that uh, if I wanted to make sure something had not been modified in transit, I've got a key, you've got a key. Uh, so I'm going to send, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to encrypt this traffic using this key. And if you decrypt it, 
then um, using that same key, then we know that we have the same key. What if a bad person in the middle were to intercept our traffic and they were able to, if they had our key, they were able to decrypt it. They could alter it and they could encrypt it again using their key and they would say, oh, and by the way, here's the hash digest. Well, we would get that, decrypt it, and say, huh, yeah, the, the, hash, digest ma- uh, the ha- hash digests match, so it must be valid. It's not valid. It was the bad actor that created that hash digest. So what this does, this adds a layer of security to that. It adds, it adds a key. Uh, I said key, I should have said data earlier. It's going to add this uh, key that only the endpoints know to this uh to the math that scrambles everything up. So the uh, the attacker would not know, the, they would not know the key. They might be able to grab the data, but they would not know the key. So they could not generate a valid uh, hash digest. All right. Now we say what mode we want to be in. Remember we had the options of transport and tunnel. And for no particular reason, I'll just say transport. Now I need to say what traffic is going to be sent inside of this IPsec tunnel. Do I want to send everything inside the IPsec tunnel? Maybe not. Uh, in this case, definitely not. I'm trying to do GRE over IPsec. I only want to send GRE traffic over this link. So I will say, I'll create an access list. I'll say IP access hyphen list. I'll do a named access list. IP access list extended, and I'll name it GRE dash IP dash sec. Uh, actually, I'll say IPsec. And I want to permit GRE traffic from anywhere to anywhere. So that defines what I would refer to as uh, as, as traffic that has been selected uh, to go across the IPsec tunnel. Now we need some connective tissue that's going to tie everything together because we've... Uh, We've set up several things here. Uh, we've set up a transform set. Uh, we've set up what traffic is worthy. But I need to set up a peer. I need to say, who is at the other side of this IPsec tunnel? Well, I'm going to say all of that inside of something called a crypto map. That's our connective tissue. I'll say crypto map. So remember, originally we said crypto isocamp. Then we said crypto IPsec. Well, now we're saying crypto map. And I'm going to give this map a name. I'll say uh, the name is VPN and I can specify a sequence number if I have multiple crypto maps. I don't, so I'll just give any number. And I'll say that the type of uh, the type of IPsec tunnel I'm setting up is going to use the traditional type of IPsec that we've been talking about where we have IPsec and we have IsaCamp. So I'll say this is, we're going to have Ike phase two preceded by Ike phase one. And it's going to give me a warning. It says this crypto map is going to be disabled until you tell me who we're talking with. Who's the peer? Well, we'll, we'll specify that. I'll say match address. This is what traffic is, is, uh, is selected to go across the, uh, the IPsec tunnel. It's matched by the IP, uh, the access list, GRE dash IP, actually extended GRE, I, yeah, I think I had a typo there. I'll just make it match. GRE hyphen IP hyphen IPsec. It's going to match that traffic. The transform set that we're going to use, which specifies my encryption and my authentication, that, um, that was called KW train. So I'll say set transform set to KW train. And now I'll set the peer. Who's at the other side of this? Well, R4 is at the other side of this. I'll say set my peer to 198.51.100.2. That's the ingress interface on R4. And the final step, now that we have number one, created the isocamp tunnel. Number two, created the IPsec tunnel. Number three, glued everything together with a crypto map. Now I'm going to apply that crypto map to an interface, my outgoing interface on R1. 
I'll go into interface gig zero slash zero and I'll say crypto map VPN. And I think we're done. Now, obviously, we've done one side right now. In order to make this work, we have to give a mirrored configuration at the other side. And I can hear you right now saying, oh no, are we going to sit here for another 15 minutes while Kevin types on all those commands? Uh, no. <laughs> I'm going to just copy and paste those. I have those in a text document. So for a time's sake, because there's nothing different here, it's just a mirror configuration, uh, I'm going to go into R4 and I'm simply going to paste the, uh, the mirrored commands in. And at this point, if all worked well, we should now have a GRE over IPsec tunnel. Let's try to confirm that. Let's see if, first of all, can I ping the other end of this GRE tunnel like I could before? Can I still ping? Actually, let's not, yeah, let's, let's do that. Let's ping 192.168.0.1. Excellent, that works. Now, let's see if I have what IPsec refers to as a security association, where it sees that we have a source and a destination that we're talking with using IPsec. And I'll say show crypto ISACEMP security association. And notice I do. I've got a couple of these here. I've got... Um, A destination of 192.0.2.1, that's R1. The source is R4. And the other direction of that conversation, the destination is R4 and the source is R1. It says that our status is active. Nice. Let's now see, are we actually doing it? Are we actually encapsulating and uh, are, are we actually encrypting and decrypting things? Let's see. Let's do a show crypto IPsec Security Association and see what we have. Oh, I love it. It says that we personally encapsulated 19 packets and when we did that, we encrypted them. We have also received 19 packets and we decapsulated. We unwrapped those and then we decrypted those. That, my friends, is verification that IPsec is, is doing what we advertised. It is protecting our GRE traffic. No matter what kind of traffic it is, we said it was going to protect it. So I hope you enjoyed that demonstration that kind of, that kind of tied everything together there with, um, with GRE and IPsec. We said that we're going to be going different layers deep throughout this deep dive. We started out with GRE, then IPsec. We combined them with GRE over IPsec. But now we have to face this issue. It's not scalable. It's great if I'm interconnecting two offices if I want to use uh, GRE over IPsec. But if I have a large organization with multiple sites, do you remember from your CCNA studies uh, the formula about how a full mesh works? If I have 10 sites... How many, how many VPNs would it take to interconnect all 10 sides directly with one another? The answer is 45. It's N times N minus 1 divided by 2. So N is 10. N minus 1 is 9. 10 times 9 is 90 divided by 2 is 45. 45 connections. That's, that's not scalable. So what can we do instead? DMVPNs. DMVPNs allow us to on demand, if there is a need for site A to talk to site F, then we can bring up a VPN dynamically without us having to configure it ourselves. We're going to be able to do that by having a sort of a, a hub and spoke topology. Let me explain. Let's say that we've got the headquarters here, uh, with uh, which has a router of R1, and it's going out. Uh, through some sort of service provider connection to all of these other sites. Maybe uh, I'm showing the, the virtual circuits. It may be just one physical circuit that it's using to go into the cloud, but it's reaching uh, branch A, B, and C. Well, within branch A and within branch B and within branch C, they all have private networks. I don't know, maybe uh, 10.1.0.0, 10.2.0.0, 10.3.0.0. Uh, for the th three different remote offices. But as they're advertising their networks, 
how do we advertise those networks over the public internet? Because those are not ratable networks. But still, we're part of the same company. I want to be able to see one another. We want to be able to see one another. Uh, Branch A wants to be able to see Branch C and so forth. How can we do that? Well, we could set up a Jiri tunnel from the headquarters to Branch A and from the headquarters to Branch B and from the headquarters to Branch C. Yeah, we could set up a Jiri tunnel to each of those and we could run a routing protocol like, uh, let's say, EIGRP. It could be OSPF, but we already talked a lot about OSPF today. Let's use EIGRP. We could use EIGRP to go over those Jiri tunnels to advertise our private network information. Here's my private network inside of A, B, or C that you can get to. And the next top address is going to be my end of this Jiri tunnel. Here's the challenge. If I'm branch A and I want to get to branch C, do I have to go through the headquarters? It's called hairpinning. Oh, that's different than hairpinning, but uh, I'm having to go through an extra hop. I'm having to go from R2 to R1 and then down to R4. I would much rather set up a connection directly from R2 to R4. The problem is I don't know how to get to, I don't know how to get to its private IP address. I need to know a public IP address that I can use to set up a VPN with. Well, what we're going to do is allow all of these spoke sites to inform the headquarters. Hey, if anybody wants to get to, get to me, here's my public IP address that they can use. Just set up a tunnel with my public IP address. It can be routed over the public internet. And then we can dynamically bring up a tunnel as needed. We're going to do this using a variant of Jiri. It's called multi-point Jiri. It can support multiple Jiri tunnels on the same interface. And we're going to use a brand new protocol now for your notes. It's called NHRP, the Next Hop Resolution Protocol. As a metaphor, it, this is not exactly how it works, but just as a metaphor, I think most of us probably understand how DNS works. You've got a DNS server, and if you want to know how to get to an, uh, a fully qualified domain name like kwtrain.com, you can go ask the DNS server, hey, what is the IP address of, of kwtrain.com? And it returns the IP address, and then you can talk directly to kwtrain.com. That's, that's similar in concept with NHRP, with NHRP, instead of having a DNS server, we're going to, uh, or HSR, uh, excuse me, NHRP, instead, with NHRP, instead of having a DNS server, we're going to have an NHRP server. And it's probably going to be at the hub. And all these remote sites, they're going to report into us their information. Let's say that uh, the end of the Jiri tunnel that terminates on R2 Let's say that it is at 10.0.0.1. Well, the, the, the actual publicly routable IP address that would get me to R2 is 192.0.2.1. Well, we can report that up to the headquarters, the hub, HQ. Let's say that the end of the Jiri tunnel connected to R3 is 10.0.0.2. Well, to get to that, I could go to 203.0.113.1. That's a publicly routable IP address. And for branch C, if my end of my Jiri tunnel is 10.0.0.3, you can get to me over the public internet at 198.51.100.1. So picture this. Let's say, for example, that the 172.16.1.0/24, a private network. Let's say 172.16.1.0/24 lives somewhere within branch A. Well, that network could be advertised over the Jiri tunnel using EIGRP. Remember, uh, even though it's a private IP address or a private address space, if I'm advertising it over my local Jiri tunnel, that's okay. It's not that it's being routed through the internet. It's just going over this tunnel to R1, which is then going to send that advertisement out to R3 and R4. So R4 says, oh, I would love to get to 172.16.1.0 slash 24. How do I do it? And I look at my EIGRP, uh, EIGRP table, and you know what it says? It says, well, just set up a VPN with 10.0.0.1 over the internet. Uh-oh. 
I cannot get to 10.0.0.1 over the internet. It's a private IP address. So what do I do? I need to go ask the headquarters, the hub, this NHRP hub, the, the, the keeper and the reiterator of all this IP address information. I need to ask it, hey, if I want to set up a VPN tunnel uh, with uh, 10.0.0.1, what public IP address do I use to do that? And it's going to look in its database and it's going to say, oh, just go over to 192.0.2.1 and uh, you'll be all set. So we're going to have this NHRP database living at the hub. It's going to be educated by all these remote sites and it knows the Jiri tunnel addresses and their corresponding publicly routable IP addresses. So let's go through an example. Let's say, for example, that uh, R4 wants to talk to R3. It just got this advertisement via EADS ERP that said, if you want to get to this network behind R3 and uh, let's, let's make up a private IP address, let's say it's 192.168.1.0 24. If you want to get to that network that lives somewhere in the, uh, in the inner workings of, uh, of branch B, then uh, you need to go to a next top of 10.0.0.2. That's what we learned via EADS ERP. Problem. I cannot get to 10.0.0.2. It's a private IP address. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send an NHRP query up to the headquarters saying, hey, can you tell me the public IP address that I can set up a, a VPN tunnel with in order to get to 10.0.0.2? And R1 says, oh, sure. I've got that in my database. You need to set up a tunnel with 203.0.113.1. R4 says, great. That's a public IP address. I can do that. And that's what happens. R4 is going to dynamically set up a tunnel. It's going to dynamically form this tunnel over with R3. Then it's able to, to get to all those, that what did I say, 192.168.1.0/24 network inside of, uh, of R3. And I'm doing this with, uh, now I know what you might be saying. You might be saying, well, couldn't you just go to the hub and it would redirect you? Yeah, but I don't want to have all my traffic going through the hub. That's going to put a big burden on it. It's going to be a suboptimal pathing. I want to go directly to R3. And that's what we can do with DMVPNs. Now here, it's not that many sites. We've got four sites. So four times three is 12 divided by two is six. I could have done all this with six. Uh, I could have done this with uh, by statically configuring six tunnels. But now I can do it with three that's a savings. And the more sites you have, the more savings you get. Now, let's see how to set this up. This is going to tie together a lot of what we have already learned today. So let me bring up a, uh, but it's going to be a different topology. Let me bring up a different topology for us. Here it is on screen. Let's, uh, let's take a look at the topology before we start typing things in. We've got the hub. That's going to be the keeper of our NHRP database. And uh, BR1 and BR2, the spokes, they're going to be advertising their internal networks up to the hub. Uh, notice that uh, BR1 in the bottom left, it seems to be on a network of 10.2.2.0 slash 24. The uh, BR2 has an inside network of 10.3.3.0 slash 24. Well, we're going to advertise those networks up to we're going to advertise those networks up to the hub. And we're going to say in order to get to these networks, you need to go to a next hop of 172.16.1.2 for BR1 and 172.16.1.3 for BR2. You see, we're we're able to advertise that private network because we're not doing it directly through the internet. We're doing it through a Jiri tunnel that we've set up with the hub. Awesome. So let's get to work here. I'm going to change my router. Let's go over to HQ. So we're now sitting at the HQ router. And just to kind of set the scenes, what I've done ahead of time, I've already got static routes set up between HQ, BR1, BR2. Uh, they're going through what I'm generically referring to as the internet router. In other words, they know how to get to one another's publicly facing IP address but they have no knowledge about how to get to the private IP addresses inside of each site. Now, they will eventually learn that information, 
because uh, we're not able to route that information over the internet, but we're going to route it over our Jiri tunnels. And we'll use EIGRP as our routing protocol. And just like we talked about earlier, we want to protect that traffic inside the protection of IPsec. So we're going to protect these uh, Jiri tunnels that get set up dynamically. We want to protect them with IPsec. Now we're doing this because we don't want to run into scalability issues where we have to connect every site in a really, really large organization with every other site. We can just dynamically form tunnels as we need them. So let's get into the configuration, shall we? The first thing we need to do is to set up the IPsec policy that is going to be applied to a tunnel once it's created. So this is going to be really similar to what we did earlier. On HQ, let's go into global configuration mode, and I'm going to say crypto. Remember the first the first part of a, an IPsec configuration? It's Ike phase one. It's the cone of silence. It's the ISACAMP tunnel. So I'm going to say crypto ISACAMP policy. I'm just going to have one, so this number doesn't matter, but I'll say policy 10. And now I'll say, what kind of encryption do I want? Encryption we'll use AES just like we did before. We've So, so far we've introduced no new commands. Now I want to say what kind of authentication. I'll do it just like we did before. I'll say authentication. We're going to use a pre-shared key. What Diffie-Hellman group am I going to use? I'll just stay with what I did before. It's group two. Awesome. Now I need to say what is that pre-shared key that is going to be shared with the, uh, the, the other the other end of this tunnel that gets set up. I'll say crypto isocamp key is Kevin's key. And just like we did before, I'll say, I don't really care who I'm talking to. I'll talk to anybody if they have the right key. So I'll just give all zeros for the address. And now we've set up Ike phase one on the hub. Let's now set up the IPsec tunnel portion, Ike phase two. I'll say crypto. IPsec, this is just like we did earlier. I'll say the transform set is KW train. And the first thing we specify, the first thing, uh, thing we specify is what kind of encryption do I want to use? And I'll do what we did before. I'll say ESP AES, encapsulating security payload, advanced encryption standard. Now I say what kind of authentication do I want to use? What kind of hashing do I want to use? And I'll use ESP SHA HMAC. We talked about all that before. And now we need to we need to uh, create a profile that contains this set. Now the reason we're going to create this profile in uh, instead of a crypto map is this profile is not going to be mapped to a specific interface. It's going to be applied to a Jiri tunnel once we bring it up. So I'm going to create a profile now. This is a little bit different than what we did before. I'll say crypto IPsec profile. I'll give it a name of Kevin's underscore profile. Just double checking the spelling there. And I'll say the transform set I want to use when I apply this profile is I want to use the transform set of KW train. Now at this point, We've got all of our IPsec stuff configured. That means when we create a Jiri tunnel, we're going to be able to take that policy of Kevin's policy and apply it to the Jiri tunnel. In fact, let's let's see how to configure that Jiri tunnel. Now we said that this is not going to be any Jiri tunnel. This is going to be a M Jiri tunnel, a multi-point Jiri tunnel. So let's see how to set that up, shall we? I'm going to say. Interface tunnel, I'll say zero this time. Oh, and remember what I told you before, if I do a do show interface tunnel zero, it's reminding us that we have this really, really low bandwidth of a hundred kilobits per second. Yeah, I think I'm I think I'm gonna change that this time. Let's say that the bandwidth is, and I'm going to make it more realistic. All of these are gig links. I'm going to make this, uh, well, 
I don't want to get mixed up with my zero. Let's see, bandwidth. I'll keep it the same as we did before. I'll just say uh, 10,000 K, which is 10 meg. I'll make the bandwidth 10 meg. Now, something we need to think about with, uh, with EIGRP. Let's say that BR2 is advertising the 10.3.3.0/24 network up to the hub and it says to get there the next top is me it's it's BR2 it's 172.16.1.3 well what would normally happen with EIGRP is this the hub would say okay got it well I'm going to advertise that out to my other neighbor down at BR1 and I'll tell them that I'm the next top and then I'll send it to you we don't want that we don't want to go through the hub we want to go directly to from BR1 to BR2 so I don't want HQ to change the next top information. Here's how we can prevent that. I can say no IP next top self for EIGRP Autonomous System 1. Another characteristic of EIGRP says that we will not advertise a network if we have learned that, uh, or we will not advertise a network out of an interface if we have learned that network on the same interface. So in this case, we got a, we, we've got an issue because BR2 is advertising 10.3.3.0 slash 24 into gig 0 slash 2 on the hub router on, on HQ. Well, HQ needs to send that advertisement for that network out of the same interface so it can go down to BR1. So we need to get rid of that split horizon behavior. And to do that, I'll say no. IP split horizon for EIGRP autonomous system one. Now I can assign the IP address for my end of this Jiri tunnel. And I'm going to be using this, the subnet for these Jiri tunnels between sites. I'm going to be using the subnet of 172.16.1.0 slash 24. So for the headquarters, the HQ router, I'm going to say that tunnel interface has an IP address of 172.16.1.1 with a 24-bit subnet mask. There's another best practice that I didn't mention earlier, and that is to reduce the maximum transmission unit. You see, the, the default MTU or the default maximum transmission unit on an interface is uh, on a Cisco router is 1,500 bytes for a packet. But we're adding some extra headers. We're adding a GRE header. We're adding an IP. We're adding IPsec headers. That's going to leave less room for the data in the packet. Now I want to be pretty flexible here because I don't know what uh, GRE can take many forms. Or oh, excuse me, IPsec can take many forms. Remember, we could we could uh, we could use the original header. We could add on headers. I want to give myself plenty of breathing room. In other words. So I want to set a lower MTU so we try to avoid fragmentation. So on this interface, I'm going to say IP, my maximum transmission unit, is 1,400 bytes instead of 1,500 bytes. So we've reduced the layer 3 maximum packet size to 1,400 bytes. But think about layer 4, where we've got a TCP segment. We don't want the TCB segment to be so large that it won't fit inside of this 1400 byte layer three packet. So I now need to create a smaller maximum segment size for TCP. And typically our IP header is about 40 bytes in size. So I'll say 1400 minus 40 is 1360. Yeah, let's say IP TCP adjust the maximum segment size to 1360 bytes and we want this router HQ we want it to be the hub in our hub and spoke topology that means BR1 and BR2 they're going to be telling us their physical interfaces IP address along with their GRE tunnel source address then they can query us asking how to get to the other router. That's how next top resolution protocol works. Well, to make sure this is all secure, we need to have a shared password for NHRP. Here's how we set up NHRP authentication. We're going to use a, an authentication string. I'll make it something that I would not recommend for the real world. I'll use Cisco. I'll say IP NHRP 
authentication, Cisco. Now the next NHRP command we, we give, it uh, I mentioned Frame Relay. I used to work with Frame Relay quite a bit. It reminds me of what we used to have to do back in the Frame Relay days. If you go back that far, you might remember that there was a Frame Relay map command that you had to uh, that you had to give, uh, or uh, you had to specify in that map command that you would allow broadcasts and multicasts to go out of a Frame Relay DLC. Otherwise, it wouldn't. Well. It's super important that we allow the uh, sending of multicast. Like I said, that's what's going to be used for routing protocols, among other things. So here's the, here's the NHRP command that says, if I receive a multicast via NHRP, like, like a EIGRP routing update from one spoke, I'm going to replicate that multicast out the other spoke. Uh, excuse me, out the other spoke. To do that, I'll say IP NHRP map multicast, and it's going to be dynamic. And I now need to say what my network ID is because all of my NHRP peers, they need to share an ID. And I'll just make it something easy to remember. I'll say IP NHRP network ID 1. Now, as part of setting up a Jiri tunnel, remember we had to specify the tunnel source and we had to specify the tunnel destination. Well, in my case, if you look at the hub router, my source is really easy. It's, uh, it's tunnel source interface gig slash two. Here's the issue. What's the destination? And the issue, uh, and the answer is, I don't know. Sometimes it's going to be BR1. Sometimes it's going to be BR2. I don't know what the destination is. I, this is a multi-point GRE interface. So instead of specifying a specific destination, I'm going to say, I'm flexible. I'm a multi-point interface. To do that, I'll say tunnel mode GRE multipoint. Now that we've done the GRE portion of the configuration, remember that we started off with a uh, with a, an IPsec configuration. We created an IPsec profile called Kevin's profile. I said we would use that to, pro uh, to protect our GRE tunnel. Here's how we now apply that to a multipoint GRE tunnel. It's a little different than what we did with just a regular Jiri tunnel. I'm going to say tunnel protection. We're going to be under the IPsec profile, Kevin's underscore profile protect, uh, protection. Just making sure I, I spelled everything correctly there. Tunnel protection. Yep, I think that looks good. And to complete our configuration on HQ, we haven't set up a routing protocol yet. Remember, we're going to be running, uh, we said we would run EIGRP, and that would just go over our GRE tunnels because we're advertising private IP address information over the internet. And the way that's possible is we're doing it inside of GRE tunnels. So let's set up, uh, let's set up uh, EIGRP. I'll say router, give a process ID of one, oh, a router EIGRP process ID one. And I'm only going to advertise my private networks, the one that my Jiri tunnel is a part of, and my inside network. I'll say network 172.16.0.0 and network 10.0.0.0. Oh, and you might be saying, hold on, Kevin, you, you forgot to give your mask. How does it know what to advertise? Remember, with EIGRP, the network command is not saying advertise this network. The EIGRP network command says, here is a network address space. And we're going to assume the default mask. If you have an interface who has an IP address that's part of this subnet, or that's part of this network, then we will advertise that network's, or excuse me, that interface's network. So in this case, I said 172.16.0.0. Do I have an IP address on HQ that falls in that range? Yeah. It's 1.72.16.1.1 slash 24. So it's going to advertise that network with a slash 24. 
not the default of slash 16. Something else we don't want to do because we are using the 10 dot address space at both sites, we don't want to do summarization. So I'm going to turn off summarization. I'll say no auto summary. And we are done with our configuration on HQ. Yes, it was more work than setting up what we did before the break, uh, but that's because I took a lot of time to walk us through each step. Basically, we set up GRE, uh, excuse me, we set up IPsec pretty much like we did before, except this time we created, instead of a crypto map, we created a profile. Then we set up uh, GRE. We did have to specify some extra stuff for GRE. We had to specify some NHRP commands. And uh, we also, uh, then we protected it with IPsec, and then we set up a routing protocol. It's going to be similar to BR1, I'll try to go quicker on BR1, and then for BR2, I won't, I won't waste your time there. I'll just paste it in again. But I wanted to show you the configuration of at least one spoke. So let's make sure I'm done with HQ. That looks good. Let's go to BR1 now, and I'll try to go through these commands a little bit quicker, just for time's sake. Let's go into global configuration mode. Let's set up IPsec, crypto, isocamp, policy. Don't really care, so I'll call it 10. Uh, the encryption that we're going to be using is advanced encryption standard. The authentication is going to be pre-share, Diffie-Hellman group 2. What is that pre-shared key? Crypto, Isakemp, key, Kevin's key. I'm willing to speak to everybody, 0.0.0.0, .0 space 0.0.0.0. .0 and let's create a transform set to say... For Ike Phase 2, what encryption, what authentication am I using? So we'll say crypto, IPsec, that's Ike Phase 2. My transform set is going to be called K, KW Train ESP AES, that's my encryption, ESP SHA HMAC, that's my authentication. Let's now create a profile that we can later apply to the tunnel. I'll say crypto IPsec profile, and I'm going to call it Kevin's underscore profile. I'll apply the transform set we just created, KW train. I'll create my Jiri tunnel. I'll set the bandwidth to 10 meg. I'll set the uh, layer 3 MTU to 1400 bytes. I'll set the TCP maximum segment size to 1360. I'll set my NHRP authentication password to Cisco. And I'll say my end of the tunnel is, or has an IP address of 172.16.1.2 with a 24-bit subnet mask. And here's where things start to, I went through that really quick because we did exactly that on HQ. But here's where things start to differ a little bit on our spoke routers. We need to specify the physical IP address or I guess let's just say the public IP address of the hub router. We're going to do that as part of that IP NHRP map multicast command. Here's how we do that. I'm going to say IP NHRP map multicast. And remember, I said dynamic back at the headquarters because I wasn't sure who I was going to be talking with. Well, here I'm talking to the headquarters. And it has a publicly facing or publicly routable IP address of... 192.0.2.1. We'll press enter. I've got to have a matching network ID for NHRP. IP NHRP network ID is 1. And now I'll say my tunnel source. If you look on the topology, it is gig 0 slash 1. And I'm going to say my tunnel mode is a GRE multipoint. The protection I'm applying is 
an IPsec profile of Kevin's profile. Let's set up EIGRP just like we did before. Router EIGRP 1 network 172.16.0.0. Network 0 .0 .0, oh, excuse me, 10.0.0.0. No auto summary, but notice I didn't have to worry about the whole split horizon and the next top self stuff because this router, BR1, it's not going to be sitting in the middle of the communication flow. Nobody's going to be bouncing off of me to get somewhere else. So that's, uh, I don't need that. So now things are configured similarly, uh, similarly to how they are on HQ. Before we move on to BR2, let's just see that uh, BR1 has registered its uh, information via NHRP with the hub. Let's go back to the hub, HQ, and let's say show IP NH RP detail. Oh, we're missing something here. Time to do a little bit of troubleshooting. So let me uh, let me quickly interrogate my my configuration. I actually had that one. I'm just going to look through my config really quick here on HQ. Let's see. Next. Let's see, I believe everything looks fine there. Let's take a quick look at BR1 and let's see. Do do do. Okay, I think I might see what's going on here. Yeah, right after I gave this command, I forgot to give something else. So let's go back into interface tunnel zero. Say interface tunnel zero. And I gave, I'll just give it again. I'll say I gave the command IP NHRP multicast and I pointed to the publicly facing The IP NHRP map multicast. I pointed to 192.0.2.1, which is HQ, but then I forgot I also need to say who is my server on this private network that I'm exchanging information with. The server is HQ, and on this private GRE network, if you look at the topology, it has an IP address of 172.16.1.1. I forgot to I forgot to specify that. I'll say IP NHRP next hop server 172.16.1.1. So I'm pointing to the same device using its public IP address and its private IP address over this Jiri tunnel. So I now need to give a command that will that will tie those together. I need to say IP NHRP map 172.16.1.1. I need to map that to 192.0.2.1. And I don't remember putting in the network ID. Yeah, I did put in the network ID. So hopefully things will be better now. Let's uh, let's go back to to HQ and see if it's working now. So on HQ, much better. Yeah, that was uh, that was my mistake. I neglected to point to the next top server from BR1, and then I needed to link that public IP address with the private IP address over the Jiri tunnel. But now we see that, yeah, I've got a registration from 172.16.1.2. That's BR1. It says we are registered. Nice. Here is the public IP address of BR1 that I will hand out if anybody says, I need to go to BR1 to get to 10.2.2. Anything. So we're done with that. Now, I don't want to have, uh, I don't want you to have to wait through me typing all those commands in on BR2. So I'm just, just going to do a quick copy paste. Let's go to BR2. I'll paste that in. And I think hopefully we're good now. Let's try it out. Let's go back to HQ and see if I have two registrations now. 
and I do look at that I've got a registration from BB1 and from BB2 excellent if I let's go back to BB2 for a second and see if I know how to get to the network inside of BR1 and if so what is my next hop let's do a show IP route command on BR2 and notice that I've learned a couple of routes via EIGRP and one of those is 10.2.2.0/24 that is inside of BR1 so let's say I'm at I'm somewhere at BR2 I want to get to a device inside of BR1. I've got a route to get there. Here's the problem. Here's where, uh, here's where DMVPNs come in and save the day. It says, oh, to get there, I've got to go to a next hop of 172.16.1.2. Well, I don't know how to do that directly. I don't want to go to the hub and then have the hub forward it down. I want to, I want to set up a tunnel directly with that IP address. Trouble is, I cannot do that through the public internet because it's a private IP address. So what I'm going to do in the background is I'm going to ask the hub, hey, if, if I wanted to get to 172.16.1.2, what is the publicly facing IP address that I would use to do that? And, and then I'll set up a tunnel with it. Well, we just saw HQ has that registered in its NHRP database. So let's do this. Let's do a ping. Let's do a ping to 10.2.2.1. That's the inside interface on BR1. And that was successful. Awesome. And uh, let's uh, make sure that that traffic was encrypted. I'll say show crypto IPsec SA. And yep, it says that we encapsulated and we encrypted and then we decapsulated and then we decrypted. Awesome. So that is our confirmation that this is working. Really hope you enjoyed that demonstration. And we're going to take this one level deeper. We said that we're going a little bit deeper and deeper and deeper. We went from GRE to IPsec to GRE over IPsec to DMVPN. And things are just getting better as we go along. We're solving more and more issues. But there's still an issue with DMVPNs. And that is, uh, for one thing, it seems like that hub and the hub and spoke topology that kind of seems like a single point of failure, doesn't it? And it also seems like we have to have a hub and spoke topology a lot of the time. And it seems like it works fine if we do have a nice, neat hub and spoke topology, but still I've got to go in and configure every one of those remote sites individually. True. I don't have to configure as many direct VPN connections, but it's still a lot of work. And sometimes I might have, different kinds of ways of getting from point A to point B. Maybe it's over a cellular link. Maybe it's over MPLS. Maybe it's over a cable modem. It's just not as flexible as we would like in some scenarios. And coming to the rescue there is SD-WAN, Software Defined Wide Area Networks. Now let's talk about the way it was with, um, this is what we just talked about, with traditional uh, WANs we would have our data center and that would be where our applications resided. And if we wanted to, uh, to run, get to a, a shared file storage area for the company, it would be at the data center that would do our security. Uh, we would have quality of service set up over those lines. If we wanted to get to the internet, perhaps we would go to the data center and then we would get out. That was somewhat confining. And even if I did have an internet connection at BR1, I still might have to go back to the data center first. It's called hairpinning uh, because I might need uh, whatever software at the data center, uh, I need to talk to it before I send my information out to the cloud or I need the software at the data center to do the security check. It gave us, it gave us reliable, or hopefully reliable, but, but it gave us predictable security. It gave us predictable performance. But yeah, I might have to go to the data center, then back to BR1, and then out to the internet. That's called a hairpin. It's, it was a suboptimal path. 
it just wasn't as flexible as we can do these days. And and it's it's a sign of the times. But back in the old days, we didn't have things like Dropbox and all of these all of these cloud-based solutions like uh, like uh, Office uh, 365 and uh, there's Azure and uh, of course Amazon Web Services, AWS, they have tons of services. Now, a lot of this stuff is available in the cloud. We don't we need or want to go back to the centralized data center because we can get security and quality of service from these cloud-based services. And I don't want to have to rely on some structured some some structured hub and spoke topology or be limited to only going over certain kinds of connections. I want to be a lot more flexible. So here's what we can do with SD WANs, software defined wide area networks. This is exciting stuff. This is a big topic today. We're going to take what we talked about at the beginning of class and we're going to do network path virtualization. With network path virtualization, even though we've got who knows what's going on in the middle? I've got a cellular link from here to here. I've got a fiber link from here to here. I've got uh, somebody sending telegraph messages. Okay, probably not telegraph messages, but we can have just a, a hodgepodge of different types of connectivity, not neatly orchestrated in some sort of a hub and spoke topology, but just however it is. Companies merge, networks get complex. SD-WAN can overcome that by using what we talked about earlier, an overlay network on top of this physical underlay network. We say, well, I would really like a direct connection from this office to this other office. Bam, you got it. And uh, do I need to go in and configure all the some of the different stuff in between, the QoS? And... No, SD-WAN has a controller. An SD-WAN controller can take care of that for us. And... What it's going to do is take what was traditionally the control plane in the router itself that made forwarding decisions, and that control plane decision-making becomes the responsibility of the SD-WAN controller. So it's not just that this router knows about its little part of the network, and this router knows about its little part of the network, and this router knows about its little part of the network. This is the eye in the sky, if you will. SD-WAN sees everything, and it can create optimal WAN connections from wherever we want to wherever we want. It's the control plane now. It's going to be able to take advantage of whatever we have in terms of physical connectivity, whether it's 5G cellular or cable modems or MPLS, doesn't matter. And it's going to be able to talk to those end devices because after all, just now, I, I gave a lot of, in fact, I forgot to give a command earlier and it messed us up. What's going to happen in the background here is we express our intent. Cisco calls this intent-based networking. I'm going to express my intent that I need this level of service between these two sites. I can, I can go in in a graphical interface and add that information. And then the SD-WAN controller that we're going to interface through something called vManage, I'll show you that in just a moment, we're going to be able to push our configuration out, appropriate configurations from the controller to the routers, there's uh, they're not going to forget. They're not going to forget to specify the NHS parameter like I did uh, earlier. So it's going to be a, uh, it's going to be more fault tolerant of uh, of user error, and it's going to be quick. It's going to reduce the administration that we have to do. It there's a lot to it. We get into it in a lot more depth in our Encore class, and I mentioned we had Encore starting next month live. But um, if you'd like to take a, a look at the management interface, uh, Cisco allows you to go explore a little bit. You might want to jot down this URL. You can go to uh, cisco.com slash go slash SD-WAN demos. You get to that page and you, you click on, I think it's like uh, live demo and then you log in and then you say access uh, your, um, your SDN pod that you have. I've logged in already and it gives you the login credentials, but I'm sitting at this vManage interface right now. Let me make this full screen so you can see it better. There, that's a little bit more readable for you, hopefully. 
And this gives us all this gives us incredible incredible visibility into what's going on with all of our WAN connections. And in the Encore class, we'll break down what all these parts are. And I want to show you how we can set up a branch office really quickly. We go under our hamburger menu and then go into configuration. And then let's go to network design. And under network design, I'm going to say manage network design. And then I'm going to go to our branch sites. And let me show you how easy it can be to add a branch location. I could go in here and say, add a new branch. I could give it a name. I can say this is BR3, for example. I could give a, uh, a profile. We won't get into configuring a profile, but I could select the particular model of Cisco router that we're using here. I'll just randomly pick one and we can select one of the circuits that we've already defined. That is, that is amazingly simple to what we have uh, traditionally, uh, traditionally had to do. So you might want to just go out to cisco.com slash go slash SD-WAN demos, uh, go into the live demo area. So you want to access the SD-WAN live demo. It gives you the credentials and you can play around a little bit. And I don't know, I don't know that they give you right privileges, but if they do, please be a good network citizen and, uh, and don't, don't create stuff that you don't clean up afterwards. All right. As uh, we prepare to wrap up, uh, I want to do sort of a comparison of these two different technologies, DMVPNs and SD-WANs. The DMVPN, like we said, typically it's going to be a hub and spoke topology and SD-WAN, it can be pretty much whatever we want. It could be a point to point, hub and spoke, partial mesh, a combination of all of the above, super flexible. The hub device in the DMVPN we set up, that could be a single point of failure. While if we can route around failures, like the hub failure if we were using SD-WAN, and there was just so much configuration. It's so administratively intense for us to do a configuration with DMVPNs while it just happens. We graphically say what we want and bam, it just happens with SD-WAN via the vManage console. Pretty amazing stuff. So that, that's what I meant at the beginning of class when I said we're gonna be peeling back the, the layers of the onion and uh, we went from GRE to IPsec to GRE over IPsec to DMVPNs and now, and now SD-WANs. I've tried to tell you the story of the evolution of virtual private networks.